Great. Well, welcome and uh, thank you, everybody. Great to have the opportunity to be here with you today and share some thoughts from where I'm coming from. Things sounds like you guys have had a, a great time so far at the Cybersecurity Festival there at Stanford and uh, certainly an honor for me to be here. So thank you for the opportunity and give, giving me a chance just to share some of the insights as far as threats that we're seeing on the front lines of cybersecurity out in the wild, as, we, as they say. And hopefully that adds some valuable content for you all to consider as, uh, as, yeah, as we focus on cybersecurity throughout the duration of, of this event. And as you proceed in your careers and lives, uh, certainly this is a topic that touches a, a large number of us. And so um, a brief background as I get started here, um, I, I, I work at a, a cybersecurity company in the private sector called CrowdStrike. And we, uh, we provide a number of different uh, cybersecurity technologies and services cloud-based. And uh, my particular role uh, within the company is on our threat hunting team. We provide managed threat hunting as a service to a number of different customers. And by nature of doing that type of work, we get to see a number of intrusions or attempted intrusions taking place on a daily basis from sophisticated, advanced, persistent adversaries, be they criminally motivated or um, working on behest of a government, activist motivations, those types of things. And we get to see that in a real firsthand, almost live um, type of account. And so uh, we get to see a number of different interesting things. So I'll, I'll, I'll take some time today to share with you some of those insights, overall trends, and some, some specifics as well that hopefully you'll find interesting and, and useful. So let's get started here. First, a brief background uh, as far as where I'm coming from. I live and work up in the great Pacific Northwest in Richland, Washington, a few hours east of the Seattle and Portland area. And I have, I, I started my career originally in the military. And since then, I've got a, about a, a decade plus of experience working in the uh, intelligence and information security fields. I, I still do serve part-time in the Air National Guard. I serve as the squadron commander for a threat intelligence squadron based in uh, Spokane, Washington at Fairchild Air Force Base. So as a member of the National Guard, I always have to give a, a, sh a shameless plug. Uh, we're, all, we're all recruiters in a sense. So if anybody's looking to use their talents and abilities from a cyber pers perspective or, or other skills as well, certainly for um, those types of opportunities to give back to, uh, to your nation, your communities, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Happy to help uh, give advice or thoughts or point people in the right directions there as well. Uh, I've been here at CrowdStrike now for a little over five years, and I've been on our threat hunting team for that entire time. I've got my contact information up there, uh, Twitter, email, free, feel free, anybody to reach out to me at any time. Always happy to connect with others who share a, a common interest and passion for uh, what's happening out there when in regards to cyber threats. So here's what I'll cover with you guys today. I'm going to talk first about just what I even mean by threat hunting. You know, the cybersecurity industry has a number of different niches and focus areas, and threat hunting is one that's relatively new as far as how it's being used, and, and there's not necessarily a full consensus on even what it, what it means or people doing it the same way. So I'll talk a little bit about our perspective on what the discipline of threat hunting is as far as how we approach it. I'll then get into some of those high-level trends, observations. What are we seeing out there? on the front lines overall. And then I'll spend a little bit of time talking specifically about the academic and healthcare sectors. And I'll do that because I figured based on the audience here today, there at Stanford and other participating um, organizations as part of the event today, I figure the academic and healthcare industries are probably where most people are located or, or where their focus areas are. So hopefully that, that'll, that'll give you some, some useful um, details uh, that will be of, of greater relevance to you. And we'll wrap up with a few specific case studies, again, these firsthand accounts in more intimate detail as far as exactly how the type of visibility that we have on certain adversaries as they're performing their intrusions and what that exactly looks like. Uh, maybe some, some level of um, granularity there that you don't normally see in these types of presentations will hopefully get you some of, of that uh, good, interesting takeaway for your sake. And then we'll wrap up with Q&A if we have time. I'll, I'll move through. Uh, again, we're covering a lot of ground here and I know we've got a hard stop at the end of my time. So we'll, we'll move quickly, but hopefully we have time for uh, maybe one or two questions at the end. So let's get started and talk about this topic of threat hunting. What does it mean to be a threat hunter in the cyber domain? Well, to help set the stage for answering at least how we go about threat hunting here at CrowdStrike, 
let me share first about what I even mean, like why would you need threat hunting? And then, then by describing where it fits in the overall defense in depth strategy for a given organization to defend their network, then that'll lead to a better way, an easier way to actually define it. So when we talk about why you would need threat hunting to help defend your network, we have this illustration that we use uh, based on a, a pyramid. And this kind of gets that overall defense in depth strategy. When you talk about cyber defense, of course, you there's a number of different areas that you need to be sure are working in concert together, almost like an onion to make sure you have multiple layers of protection uh, as adversaries are creative and trying to find different ways to, to take advantage and, and, and exploit various layers of, of security that you may have employed. So at the base layer, of the pyramid to represent the greatest prevalence as far as what's out there in the wild threat wise and what is most commonly seen and also at the bottom of the pyramid rep representing the least amount of sophistication and that is all that kind of noisy commodity type malware maybe also just uh, malvertising type of activity widespread malicious software that's that's not necessarily targeted it's just out there it's voluminous there's a lot of it and so of course you're naturally going to have a base level of, of security technology there to help protect you in an automated fashion that's where your antivirus products come in uh, next generation antivirus kind of that next level of what previously has been in place and those sort of technologies are going to allow you to identify and, and automatically prevent and block those types of commodity malware threats that are out there. As you move up the pyramid, you're moving up in sophistication. So it doesn't quite happen as often, but still certainly happens where particular adversaries are, are going to be smarter and more capable in what they're trying to do. And so as a result, they're gonna employ some more advanced techniques against you. Maybe they start getting into the fileless malware techniques. So stuff running only in memory. So your system's gonna have our, your, your next gen antivirus technology or whatever it may be. Um, the automated technologies you have may not be as good about blocking it. So in that case, you're going to want to still at least be able to have some forensic, some data available to your network security analysts for them to be able to perform some sort of forensic analysis on what's going on. As, as weird things start to happen, they can identify it quickly. You're, that's where that EDR technology comes in. And EDR is an acronym that, that stands for Endpoint Detection and Response. Essentially, what it means is having visibility as far as what's happening throughout your network uh, coming in as data streams to your security operations center where you can uh, then perform analysis and, and response. But at the very tip of the pyramid, at the very top, you have the even more advanced and sophisticated threats. These are those state-sponsored adversaries, those, um, uh, th those, those actor groups who are perhaps funded by a government and therefore have a lot of resources at their disposal to come up with techniques and tactics that are gonna bypass security controls and try and hide in any sort of EDR data. Uh, maybe they're criminally motivated. So they have the financial, the financial means and resources and development necessary to, uh, to perform similar uh, tactics and techniques that even a state sponsored adversary would. So these guys are trying to hide, they're trying to blend in and bypass any of those existing security controls and technologies to hide in the weeds. And so what that is where threat hunting comes in. We are that last layer of defense, whereas if all your preventative existing security controls somehow fail, somehow that really sneaky adversary is somehow able to get on, maybe they have compromised credentials some way from some third party site or some other manner, then they're able to get in on your account because you've there's, there's some compromised credentials, they get onto the network, okay, well, Threat hunting is going to be there to almost assume breach, but be looking throughout the network for just even the most subtle indications that potentially someone is on that network who's not supposed to be there. So it requires a great deal of, um, uh, of uh, patience and uh, proactive thinking and expertise to be able to do that effectively, but uh, we work hard at it every day. So that's what we do here to help people understand what all the steps are like how do you go about threat hunting now that we understand in a sense what it is how do you actually go about um, doing that effectively we've made up a very a basic acrostic awesome. here recently that um that, that walks through some of those steps um the acrostic is based on the word search which makes sense because again we're searching for those those adversaries on the network uh, in essence i won't go through this in detail we actually uh, put out a report annually, our, our, our latest annual threat hunting report from CrowdStrike came out recently. It's publicly available. The link will be here at the end and I think the slides will be shared. So certainly encourage you all to check that out. And we go into more detail there about this methodology for those who 
are interested in going into threat hunting or trying it out or, or looking into it a bit more. Essentially the search acronym, walk you through it here just for a moment. Uh, it, it's based on, you gotta have good data in order to hunt across your network. So you need visibility, you need that telemetry coming from your endpoints and different parts of your network. So you have that full vis visibility um, and based on all that telemetry coming in. And when I talk about telemetry to threat hunt on, to threat hunt on what I'm getting at is uh, really like process level detail of what's happening on the machines, the metadata of the behaviors of the system, the operating system itself. Um, we're not looking at content on machines, um, like what, what are in the files that certain people open. No, we're looking to see, okay, well, did Microsoft Outlook launch? And if so, then why is it that process then spawning a command shell that may indicate, okay, something malicious might be happening here. Somebody may have been exploited, maybe somebody got fished or something like that. It was, it's those sort of chains of events in the data that we're looking for. There's just hundreds, thousands, millions of types of behaviors like that that we're looking for in our hunting process. You analyze that, uh, eventually as you identify, oh, indeed something suspicious, looks rather suspicious here as far as what's going on. Somebody's using a net use command in the midst of some other activities in this short period of time, and that's unusual for this account or this computer. Um, we'll, we'll piece that together. You've got this burst of suspicion happening. That's where we're going to take the time then to notify that potential victim, that customer of ours, and uh, reconstruct all that's what, what, that, what has been happening in some sort of a timeline type of fashion and communicate to them what we're seeing and why we think it's potentially malicious. And then that communication would then allow them uh, to activate their response team to go in and actually clean it up. So we as hunters, we're looking for the adversary we find, we track the adversary, and then an incident response team would actually do the, the piece of, of rebuilding, cleaning, or, or fixing whatever the problem would be. And then that last step, hone, honing in, it just speaks to the iterative nature of threat hunting. Whenever we identify adversary activity, we're pretty thorough and and reviewing it so that if there are any new behaviors, or maybe it's even reported from a third party, if there's any new activity that an adversary may be trying to employ with new techniques that are out there. We want to be looking for that. We want to be hunting for that. So we build that into our processes of the things that we look for as threat hunters. So that's some background about threat hunting. Again, I as I touched on, threat hunting is a is somewhat of a buzz term in the industry today. People use that term to, to talk about other ways of, of doing security practices for network, uh, for network security, and that's totally fine. Some people use it to refer to, hey, maybe they're hunting across an adversary's use of their C2 command and control infrastructure uh, domains and, and uh, IP stuff that they use for, for controlling their, their intrusions. Um, or sometimes it's hunting across malware repositories to find new evidences of a particular adversary with new variants of their implants, uh, or, uh, um, or sometimes it's an ad hoc one at a time, one, once um, periodically going forth and looking for certain behaviors on a network. Those are all different ways people go about threat hunting. It's just different than we go about doing it in very much a continuous fashion, looking across all our customers all the time. And, and, uh, and, and trying to provide that, that, that continuous support because you never know when that adversary will strike. Adversaries are smart, particularly the, the advanced ones, they're gonna strike in the middle of the night on a weekend, you need that 24 seven, 365 threat hunting uh, and to be there and have your back in case, in case the worst happens. So now let's move into what, what are we seeing trend wise as far as the threats that are out there across the cyber landscape today. And as I get into this, I'll take a moment just briefly as I talk about particular adversaries. This is the naming convention we use here at CrowdStrike, so I may use these terms periodically. And just know that and it seems like every vendor out there and in the government as well, everybody has their own different names for these adversaries. And a lot of times they're referring to the same group of criminals or hackers, even though there's different names for them. Um, that's why I just wanted you to be able to use this animal type of theme that um, is, is a reference largely to the national animal or some sort of distinctive for that country. So if I'm talking about a panda, that's typically a Chinese based adversary. If I'm talking about a spider, those are e-crime adversaries and so on. So that's, this, uh, this background here hopefully will give some, some explanation as you see these names pop up periodically. Okay, let's talk uh, overall trends. We look at the big picture. So our team uh, here as a threat hunting team at CrowdStrike, we track all the intrusions that we find. And when I talk about, when I mention that we're hunting and uncovering intrusion activity on a daily basis, that's no exaggeration. Multiple times a day, we're seeing interactive intrusions where you've got an adversary on 
on the other end of the keyboard, so to speak, where they are interactively inside a network performing their operations on objectives in an interactive fashion, whether they're criminally or motivated, state-sponsored, whatever it may be. And we track that meticulously and uh, we are tracking just what we're seeing across our customer base. We also have a separate threat intelligence team at CrowdStrike and they're tracking everything globally uh, in addition to just what we're seeing on our customer base. But I'll be speaking today of, of stuff that we're seeing specifically across our customer base, which is widespread, um, very well representative of what's happening globally as we are deployed globally with customers in every geo region and every vertical. So this is a pretty good uh, sampling of, of what you could expect to see on a, on a global trend scale. And, and here we break down, okay, let's, uh, as we look at the number of intrusions relative to each other and how they are attributed then to different adversaries, this is the breakdown here on this slide. And you see the overall numbers have, have risen dramatically over the last few quarters. And this trend, the, the upward trend has continued now into Q3 as our Q3 report is about to be released here in a few weeks and we'll get this, uh, this updated even further then. But the bottom line here is you see there's been a dramatic rise in recent quarters and the big driver of that rise has been on the criminal side of things. The state sponsored activity still exists. It's been pretty steady, but criminal adversaries have increased their level of sophisticated interactive intrusions. And again, that's what we focus on here, not just the, the noisy commodity malware type of threats or, or general phishing campaigns that are widely known out there. That's not what we track. And when it comes to our threat hunting, we're looking for those interactive targeted intrusions where you have an adversary actively on the keyboard on a network trying to do nefarious activities or at least trying to get in. And so why? Why is criminally motivated activity been such a spike here in the last few uh, quarters and, and year or two? And the big driver for this is, as you, some of you are probably aware or would assume, the rise in a more sophisticated type of ransomware attack, uh, what we refer to as big game hunting, where essentially you have these criminally motivated actors who are out there. And whereas in years past, maybe they've tried to deploy ransomware in a more general fashion, widespread, see what sticks. Maybe they hit grandma down the street with some ransomware and hope they could, she can figure out how to pay in Bitcoin to get them a payback. And, and you know, over time they realized there wasn't a great return on investment with their original tactics for some of that widespread ransomware deployment. So they've developed this new approach. We've, kind of, we've dubbed it as big game hunting, but essentially what it is, is you have more adversaries now who are, who are performing intrusions against entire enterprises, entire organizations, and infecting the entire organization, and then executing their ransomware attack against that entire network. And when that network then is encrypted and brought to its knees, they can then extort the entire organization for a payout, and you thus have much larger payouts uh, because the, um, the stakes are much higher in that type of a scenario. So that's what we've seen. And, and that evolution of that e-crime uh, ecosystem has evolved even further from just that basic big game hunting these adversaries now. Some of them are vertically integrated and very well developed internally, but you also have affiliate networks where you've got a developer of a ransomware and a type, and they will then sell access to that to others, other affiliate groups, criminal groups, who then their expertise is taking that ransomware and actually getting it to be deployed and infected on different networks. And then they give a cut of the proceeds to the to the developer. And, and um, so, and then there's other groups that then specialize in in doing the negotiations of the victim between the victims and the attackers themselves, which is all sorts of the, 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 the development of the e-crime ecosystem is, is really remarkable here. But as a result, it's become a, a huge problem, particularly, and this has certainly impacted the academic and, and healthcare industries as well, as I'm sure you guys have, have been seeing and tracking. So we'll talk about a few examples here, but that's basics what, what we've been seeing and what's been going on. Um, when you look at and you compare the primary types of actors who are the ones doing the sophisticated intrusions, we don't see a lot of hacktivist or politically motivated activity using the level of sophistication that would lead to an interactive targeted intrusion. Um, they're usually just kind of doing the DDoS or maybe a web defacement type of a campaign. Uh, when you're talking about the real high stakes, real uh, situation where you're talking about a painful ransomware again, at an enterprise scale, or uh, intellectual property theft. You know, you're talking about adversaries who are state-sponsored 
um, working on at the behest of a government for espionage purposes or well-resourced criminals. Um, and then it's interesting when we took when we look at a big picture. Okay, what are some of the distinctives between those two groups when they're performing their intrusions? Um, there's a lot of talk of there's a blending of oh they, they're they're adopting a lot of the same tactics with each other, and that's certainly true. But if you were to look bottom line, what are some of the key differences? Just um, just as you perhaps if you're going into a cybersecurity career, as you look at uh, you know not wanting to fall victim to these folks. Um, what are some considerations? And those considerations would be if you're the criminal adversaries, they're all about speed. They recognize the need uh, if they're as being financially motivated that, that they need to accomplish their ran typically ransomware attack quickly. And, uh, and in doing so, they're gonna, they're gonna prioritize speed over stealth. And so they, aren't, they don't really care if they're noisy, if they're gonna uh, maybe raise some flags for a security team quickly, as long as they can accomplish what they need to accomplish before responders can take action. That's why speed is so critical in, in the security game as we try and defend our networks. They're also a bit more opportunistic as far as what they're going after. They're gonna go after an organization they see as perceived to have weaker defenses. Uh, try and get an easier uh, an easier kill that way. Whereas state-sponsored adversaries, they have very specific targets. So they're going to go after who they need to go after to answer their intelligence requirements. And in doing so, that means they have to be more creative in, in how they're going to gain that initial access. So more sophisticated social engineering techniques. Maybe they'll even go for the supply chain compromise or take advantage of some sort of trusted network connection. We see that more often with state-sponsored adversaries. And they're just generally more methodological and advanced in what they're doing. So they do things. We've seen some remarkable work from state sponsor and adversary. One quick example I like to share. I mean, they, they will replace native system tools on the machine with their own backdoored versions. So for example, we've seen at a telecom, uh, there was an intrusion where you had a, um, a sophisticated state sponsored adversary they uh, against a this was a Linux machine that they were targeting. They replaced one of the uh, SSH binaries, which is a administrative networking tool, and they replaced it with their own version. Where if you use the tool for your administrative purposes, it all looks the same. But you, when you would run certain commands with this tool, the results would filter out any potential evidence of the adversary's presence. So if the adversary had a command and control IP address that they were talking to and you ran the command that would pull up IP address connections for that machine, it would filter out the results and you would have no idea uh, that, that it was being filtered out. Or also it would, anytime somebody would log in using that tool, it would, it would steal and, and, and copy the password, uh, the credentials to a hidden file on the system that the adversary would then go and they could always be looking and, and gleaning those new credentials coming in. So um, that's just a flavor of the type of um, sinister, uh, techniques that adversaries like to use when they're operating in these more persistent ways. All right, overall uh, breakdown by vertical here, as far as what we see, again, from an Overwatch team perspective as the most targeted industries relative to each other. And you'll see that the, or excuse me, the healthcare and academic industries are right there in the top 10. Healthcare has been growing quite significantly. Um, a couple of years ago, it wasn't even in the top 10 but it's continually grown. We'll talk about some of the reasons why uh, as, we, as we proceed here. Uh, academic, the, the academic industry has been pretty consistent in the top five or top 10 for several years now. So I'll start going into a few reasons that give some explanation to these trends, starting with the academic sector. So you there, uh, many of you I know are probably university students or at least work for uh, Stanford or other universities. And so when you consider, yeah, it, it's, it's, it's worth being aware that at, at a university, you are heavily targeted, particularly by government-backed APT state-sponsored adversaries. And the reason for that is, well, there's a handful of reasons from our perspective. Typically, there is this reputation that adversary or that university networks are more open and so easier to compromise because of the nature of wanting to share information and be collegial and and just the whole nature of, of what it means to be a university and academic institution. And so in the past that has led to this perception that yeah, maybe university networks are easier to get to. And so there's this, there's certainly a trend in the past where adversaries will then compromise university networks. And there's a lot of resources, a large you know, services available there, a number of servers that can be taken advantage of. And then they, they kind of plant there and use that as a hot point then for further downstream attacks even as well. So with that happening in the past, that continues to be then a, a remain a popular target for them, given some of, of uh, the, the track record there. And also you think about it, university networks store a lot of really valuable 
actionable data, not just student PII type of information and data, but you talk and think about all the research and technology that's developed at universities. And there's oftentimes uh, affiliated healthcare research as well. All that type of, of, of stuff leads to universities being very valuable for various types of attackers to go after. And when they do so, uh, when we look from our perspective, firsthand account, what are the most popular ways that adversaries are gaining access to university networks when they go after them. Of course, we know from public reporting stuff, spear phishing is a really popular way. Um, but what some of the other things that we see a lot of, we see a lot of brute force attacks where maybe there are publicly exposed um, or, or public access point for public access points for external remote services like VPN servers, especially now as there's more remote learning and, and even um, even now with COVID-19 and more students are doing their work remotely, you know, those external services lead to more opportunities for adversaries to, to try and brute force maybe different password and, and username combinations to try and gain access and those brute force attacks. Um, password spraying is another specific way that that brute force is being implemented. If you want to look that up, that is certainly being effective in a number of cases where there's not the sufficient multi-factor authentication. So multi-factor authentication, whenever it's available to you and personal and, and professional use, absolutely please take advantage of that because it's remarkable how often that is not always used. Um, also vulnerable public facing servers. So you have different uh, servers available that are exposed to the internet that are not running the fully patched version or that may have some sort of vulnerability associated with them. That certainly still happens as well. So uh, those are some key considerations for you as uh, people affiliated with universities. Here's a specific campaign that's been uh, reported publicly and our threat intelligence team has tracked that I think is certainly relevant to you guys in the academic sector, uh, even here and right now, just in the last uh, couple months since August and going through uh, September and uh, could perhaps even be still be active. Uh, but there's a particular adversary based about, out of Iran that we've dubbed Scholar Kitten. Uh, this is a group of Iranian based uh, actors who are performing spear phishing attacks against uh, university students and staff. And in doing so, their method has been spear phishing to gain initial access. And what they're doing is they're sending these spear phishing lures in a manner that is trying to uh, dupe victim, potential victims into clicking a link that will allow them to uh, go to an actor control page that will they'll enter their credentials. Well, the, and what they're trying to do is they're trying to, with the URLs that they're trying to convince you to click on, are some sort of spoof off of an actual legitimate URL that your university may have, often in times affiliated with the library or like your Blackboard or whatever your remote education uh, service platform is. And uh, then they'll, they'll, you know, they'll manipulate the domain to make it something that, that redirects to a, a page that they control. And then they'll set up that redirect page to look like the actual login page for the actual library or Blackboard service or whatever it may be, and hope that you will then enter your credentials there as they encourage you to uh, to do so. And then once they have the credentials, they have access and somewhat game over from there. So this is certainly a threat to be aware of. It still happens. Spear phishing is an old tactic, trying to get people to, to click on malicious links, um, but it is still effective. So don't let it be you. Okay, one more thing here. Certainly ransomware is an issue in the academic industry or the academic sector, uh, different academic institutions being hit by it. Even since mid-August, so just in the last couple of months, there have been a notable number of big game hunting intrusions. That's what the BGH on the slide stands for, big game hunting. Again, that's where you have an adversary going after a particular organization trying to ransom the entire network. And, and so there's been a number of different major criminal adversaries doing so with different variants of the, their, their custom built ransomware that they use for these purposes. And an interesting development here in recent times when it comes to these enterprise level ransomware attacks is now uh, as as I think fewer and fewer victims were, were paying up and of course there's there's uh, government guidance too that that um, that may inhibit the adversaries from from fully um, profiteering from what they're doing here so they've they've evolved some of their techniques after the exploitation and after the ransoming to where if they don't receive their payment, they are now threatening with ex, you know, extortion purposes to, to actually release the data that they have encrypted and locked down. And so if you don't pay up, you not only are going to not get your files back, we're going to release your data to the public or it's going to be sold off to the highest bidder. And so hopefully through that, they're hoping to get more likelihood of payout. And now they've gone even one step further to where um, if you don't pay out, 
we're going to leak your information publicly, and we're going to DOS you. We're just going to denial of service. We're going to flood your network with traffic, so your network isn't even going to be usable. Like these, are, this is the sort of um, escalation that is happening here in when it comes to these ransomware attacks with, with significant ramifications. Okay, let's turn now to the healthcare sector. What are we seeing? Of course. Everybody knows COVID-19 has had major impacts worldwide in all sorts of different ways, and certainly within the cybersecurity domain as well, as that is used in a number of different ways for spear phishing themes, and 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 it's led to greater work from home. So greater wider workforce means more remote access to work networks, and that means more access points and more potential for being exploited through those remote, remote measures. As when we look at initial access that we see firsthand um, in the healthcare sector specifically, it's again, that brute forcing of externally, external remote services and also vulnerable servers that are um, exposed to the internet that are not fully patched or not fully um, updated and uh, where, where vulnerabilities can be exploited. We actually have a blog about what we've been seeing that goes into some more detail on the healthcare sector. I encourage you to check that out. I'll, I'll share a few more notes here on healthcare as we continue as well. One thing to note is um, it's not just criminals, as you have seen in the news, that are going after and taking advantage of the increased focus on the healthcare sector in our current times. Certainly, um, there are some of our nation's enemies who are going after health organizations as well, maybe for different reasons though. So for example, this, uh, this summer, we, uh, the Department of Justice indicted some Chinese operatives who were performing and facilitating intrusions against particular research institutions that were uh, and specifically trying to obtain information and data related to COVID-19 vaccines and treatment research. And it's not just the United States who has seen China active and going after this type of intellectual property. The Spanish have done taken similar measures, and and uh, this isn't this isn't brand new. This is certainly a, a very real threat that, um, or as you have a race amongst multiple countries trying to find the proper treatments and solutions to deal with COVID nineteen. And ransomware certainly exists for criminal purposes and has had its share of impact across the healthcare sector. A lot of you are probably aware of this, seeing a lot of this makes the news. Uh, perhaps uh, one of the more significant attacks in recent times happened in Germany last month, where you may have heard that a hospital network was hit by ransomware. And as a result, the network was taken offline. And so they had to start turning people away to get treated elsewhere. And there was one woman in particular who reportedly based on public reports, uh, got delayed in the treatment that she needed because of that. And as she was being transferred to the other hospital, wound up dying in the process. So there you have loss of life now from this escalation and ransomware attacks. That's a, certainly a tragedy, very unfortunate. The One of the interesting angles to this particular event is that there have been a, a handful of criminal ransomware adversaries who have said since COVID-19 broke out that we are not going to attack Health, the healthcare sector. We're not going to target hospitals with our ransomware because we're good people and we're just we're we're, we're actually performing a service. Um, they have you know great public relations. They like to think of themselves as performing a service to their victims because they're helping their victims identify vulnerabilities in their networks, and then the ransomware payment is just the payment for their services of finding these vulnerabilities. Well, since these since these criminal adversaries are such great people doing such great thing. They've, some of them have taken the extra step of swearing off targeting hospitals because they don't wanna hurt people. Uh, okay, well, that's all well and good, but it turns out one of the actor groups who we track as Doppel Spider was one of the groups who claimed to swear off hospitals. That was the group responsible for this attack in Germany. So then it's like, what, are they just going back on our word? Well, no, it turns out that um, uh, as, uh, as we've come to understand, this adversary did not intend to target this hospital. They were actually targeting an affiliated university. And as nature, the nature of these types of attacks of this type of malware, as it, it a lot of them have worming capabilities to try and get to in an automated fashion, other parts of the network because it wants to spread so they can lock down as much of the network as possible to get a higher likelihood of a payout from their victim. Um, by nature of some trusted connections there, that it spread into the hospital's network. So it was not intended, but it was collateral damage. Um, so um, so when, that, when the adversary learned of this and law enforcement reached out to them, the adversary then did release the decryption keys 
um, but still um, goes to show that uh, this uh, it's a nasty world out there when it comes to this ransomware activity. Serious, serious challenge. And then again here, even more recently, a major hospital system, as I'm sure some of you have been tracking, was taken offline and uh, hundreds of locations uh, being impacted with a, a widespread ransomware attack. That uh, was another a separate adversary who I don't think had, had was one that had sworn off hitting hospitals. And, uh, and so this particular adversary using their Ry Ryuk ransomware, Wizard Spider, they're one of the most uh, prolific uh, ransomware adversary certainly out there in the wild today. And uh, as, of la as of a few months ago, I think they had in total actually had collected about the most ransomware proceeds from any other adversaries we had been tracking at the time. So uh, certainly a big player in this space. Uh, we do, this is of course something we track very closely in our threat hunting and uh, we take great pride in being able to identify, identify these guys as soon as they start knocking on the door and trying to get in so that, um, you know, in combination with the technology that our customers use, we're able to block and identify and kick these guys out before they have much of an impact. But um, we also work to keep our, uh, keep our folks aware of these latest trends by giving them updates and uh, reporting uh, from our end of things. All right, well, with our last few moments here, I'll get into a few specific case studies give you even further insight into some of these attacks against academic and healthcare organizations from, uh, from, from really how we view it to give you a better sense of, of, of what these look like from an inside view. So here's the first one here. Uh, Velvet Chalima was the adversary. So that's a North Korean based adversary uh, targeting an academic institution, uh, university, and this was uh, several months ago now. And this, this was a campaign that was reported widely. At the time though, um, we, we didn't know yet that it was related. This was an, a university that realized they had an issue. And so they reached out to us for help realizing that they had saw some unusual activity on their network. So we sent out our incident responders and as threat hunters, we teamed with them as they um, started gaining visibility as far as what was happening on the network. And we immediately started identifying some strange use of valid accounts where these accounts would start interacting with files in directories where the files by name shouldn't be located. So, or, or the files themselves weren't really what they purported to be. So for example, maybe you have a, um, a cmd.exe, so a command shell uh, binary that was renamed as something else or vice versa, or maybe it was an adversary tool, custom tool that they had brought down and they renamed it as WinRAR or some or 7-Zip or some other otherwise uh, benign type of program or tool. And so when you see those types of mismatches as a threat hunter, you start thinking, okay, this is unusual. Something strange is probably happening here. And then you start piecing the, the puzzle together. Okay, well, what account is the, the account that's interacting with these files? Where else has that account been logging into? You start, you start to realize, wow, even though this, this, this compromise had initially happened well before we had visibility, um, just through threat hunting, we could pick up, okay, this, yep, that's probably a compromised account. This is probably a compromised machine. Let's start mapping out the, the issues here. And so we, we were able then to, uh, to help them clean up from this particular intrusion, which was good. Uh, one of the other interesting angles of, of this campaign though was the adversary was often gaining their initial access through the use of malicious browser extensions as part of uh, some phishing messages. So they would dupe the users into uh, installing a malicious Chrome browser extension. Well, in this case, uh, this is a good takeaway for you guys, uh, potential student, I guess uh, some of the students there at, at uh, your university. What, one, of the, one of the students had fallen victim to this attack, so they had their account, their university account compromised. The adversary, when they had that account, when the adversary got their account credentials, they, they did what many adversaries do. They're gonna see if those credentials work in other uh, services that that user may, um, may be employing. So for example, this student on his university account used his same password in his, for his Gmail account. And since he was reusing his password, they were then able to guess his username and they then got into his Gmail account and they used his Gmail account, not just to mess around and send messages and whatnot, but they use his Gmail account to go on as a Google profile to the Google Chrome store where all the Chrome browser extensions are listed. They posted their malicious browser extension there and they used this guy's Google account to comment about how great this browser extension was. All his friends should, should deploy it. It's gonna give you these great, I think custom font, fonts was what the, the, um, 
the what what the browser was supposedly to be used, what the extension was supposedly to be used for, and so it helped then um, add some level of credibility or at least uh, somewhat advertise for their malicious Chrome extension to then be used and hopefully dupe further users into installing it. So a creative technique there and a great reminder for you to not reuse your credentials. Okay, one more example here I'll share for the academic industry. This was a ransomware attack that we saw firsthand uh, brute forcing uh, over an RDP server uh, that the adversary then through that burst brute forcing password spraying gained access. And uh, so we, we that's something that we hunt for is unusual use of accounts where you see multiple failed login attempts. And then right when they gain access, they start dropping other tools that are going to facilitate their ransoming of the network. So we, again, certainly identified one, uh, they dropped a tool called IOBit Unlocker, which is a, a freely available tool. It allows processes to be essentially turned off so that they're more easily, files can more easily be, be encrypted for the ransomware attack. As soon as we see something like that, we, we're, we're on it, we're communicating with the customer so they can, they can take measures to, uh, to uh, you know, kill that network account and, and even isolate that machine from the network so there's no real impact overall. And, uh, and we actually have a good blog about some of the detailed insights of these types of attacks and some of the trends that we see from a firsthand account. So links there and the slides that we shared, I encourage you guys to check that out. Uh, one more example here, this is a healthcare organization that was um, compromised. It, this was a pre-existing compromise. Uh, another example, we kind of came in after the intrusion had already happened. And we saw some we saw web shells on a web server that got our attention. Um, but the other interesting thing here that I will point out uh, specifically is that we, we see the adversary on the, on the command line rooting around looking for things as they try to accomplish their actions on objectives. And in this particular case, you could see them specifically doing file searches for health related information. So here's a quick snapshot. We saw them doing dir commands. That's like file listing commands for in radiology directories. So they're trying to get radiology data, RIS, radiology information system type data from this particular organization, maybe on particular um, patients or for particular research. Um, that type of thing. So these guys, this goes to show that this was a suspected Chinese-based adversary. They're very focused and they know what they're going for here. So you are certainly up against um, very um, proficient adversaries who are targeting uh, your networks. And the last example here, I'll, sh I'll share another healthcare organization. This was against a Linux system. So uh, the previous examples I was sharing were all Windows-based, but we certainly see on a regular basis uh, targeted intrusions against a Linux systems as well. We also see intrusions against Mac OS systems, um, uh, uh, certainly in addition to that. And in this Linux intrusion, we saw there was a vulnerable Apache web server that was compromised and we picked up on it because we identified some unusual discovery commands happening under that compromised Apache process as soon as they uh, had compromised it. And so uh, when, whenever you see something like that, um, maybe they're trying to run a command like a who am I that, uh, that you know, you know, who, who is it, you know, they're trying to look for the username account or an IF config to see what are the, what are the network connections and, and just doing some basic reconnaissance. A lot of times administrators do that for legitimate reasons and these adversaries, but adversaries do it too because they wanna use the tools already on the system so that they can kind of blend in, but they still, they need to do some reconnaissance and get the lay of the land. So we look for, for collections of that type of behavior within certain time periods. So that helped us identify this. And uh, another interesting uh, thing here, usually in a Linux intrusion, the adversary is gonna use Linux-based tools like wget or curl to try and bring down their tooling for uh, follow-on activity. And in this case, they actually use the upload feature of the web server itself. It's not something we see every day, but just an example, this was again, a healthcare organization. So um, that, uh, that was, that, those are some of the interesting angles here, that particular healthcare-based intrusion. So. That wraps up everything I had here to share today. I think we're about out of time. I will make one more plug here for our annual threat hunting report. I encourage you to check it out if any of the material I shared here today was interesting to you. And with that, I will conclude and turn it over to the to the coordinators here. If there, if we do have any time for questions or if we need to sign off, I appreciate again the time to, to talk with you today. Thank you very much.